Hello, sisters, and welcome to Today's Woman Rising, where you can be empowered to rise into your healthiest, happiest, and most powerful self. Today we have with us Candice Onita. Candice is an international speaker and is Australia's number one feminine success mentor. Her background in corporate Australia for 13 years and then starting up five successful companies with up to a million in annual earnings led her to the realization that feminine principles were sadly lacking in the business world. Candace has personally taught over 100 workshops and worked with over 2,000 women from around the world on the topics of self-development, meditation, and feminine power. And today, Candace is going to be talking to us about discovering our real desires to get what we want. Welcome, Candace. It's an honor to have you with us today. Oh, and it's an honor to be here, Kuros. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very, very honored to be here. Definitely, definitely. Um, so I absolutely love your work around desire. Um, and to start off, I'd love if you would define for us, like, what is desire? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because uh, I think that it's a word that is kind of quite charged sometimes for people in that there's shame around it sometimes or there's a misunderstanding about what it is, how to work with it and how really, really deeply important it is for us as women to be understanding our real deep desires. I love that. Um, yeah, so what, so what is desire from that? So desire, the way I'd ask, answer that a little bit further is desire is to be understood as a spectrum. So a spectrum from sort of little seemingly meaningless everyday desires through all the way through sort of mid-level desires and all the way through to the deep, dark, largely, at first at least, unconscious level of desire. Now, when I use the word desire, it's a bit more on the line of, um, you know, Napoleon Hill's quote, which is, um, desire is at the starting point of all achievement, right? So what he was sort of positioning is desire is the engine behind everything. So I'm not just talking about sexual desire here or mean, seemingly meaningless, mundane things in the world. This is something that literally fires us up, gets us plugged in, gets us turned on and allows us to have the juice and the power to do what we want to do in life and how we want to serve. I love that. And I love that you quoted Napoleon Hill. I absolutely love his work. Um, how, so how do you get into your real desires? How do we tap into that? Good question. So the thing at first, I, when I work with the, what I call the desire formula, I, I do, um, I train women, you know, I do, I work with what are called the feminine arts. And one of the arts is the art of desire. And there are three aspects to desire that in my experience and my observation in my life and working with, you know, women from all around the world, there are three things that we need to cover. And so, and I call it the desire formula. Now, the first one is I was mentioning a little bit before is the, the desire spectrum. Okay. The spectrum that runs from, okay, desire is as, as little as, oh, I'm really hungry right now. I think I want to go and make a sandwich, right? So if you know anything about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, he created this pyramid where at the very bottom of the, the pyramid of needs or wants or desires are what are called the, the needs for survival, right, and safety. They're the very basic foundational fundamental levels of desire that if we don't have those in our life, then we can't really start to talk about love and purpose and self-actualization, which are the higher levels on Maslow's hierarchy of needs and desires, right? And so we need to first understand the desire spectrum. So this little, I need a sandwich now through to, oh, okay, I have these goals. I have this wanting to, to be successful. I want to get a really nice house. I want to have a great relationship. I want to, you know, do good things in the world. All the way through to where we start to hit on what I call where the rubber hits the road in terms of understanding the desire spectrum. And that is the deep, deep levels of desire then when we start to think and want and talk about uh, our purpose our sense of mission and when we start to talk about the things that we either neither really even admit to ourselves or think about uh, but they're important to dive into to dig into and to discover in order to actually get all these other desires met 
And I call this the hidden level of desire or the unconscious desires. So needless to say, in our time together today, where I'm going to sort of give you an idea about what this is, but to get to this end of the spectrum, the deeply unconscious, juicy, deep level of desire is a process and it takes, you know, it takes some coaching to get through to that level. Now, the reason that we, uh, the way we do that is the second thing, which is called desire digging or desire mining. And then we have to dig down through these levels in order to get to the unconscious levels. Now, I think another thing, and you're asking me sort of what is desire, and I think one of the other things to um, sort of get a, an elephant out of the space, I call it, let's get this elephant out of the space, that speaking about desire can often come off as something that seems like it's sort of selfish or self-centered, like I want to understand my desires, I want to get my desires, it's all about me, me, me. The opposite is true. When you actually have the courage and the, the fortitude and the, you know, the, the, the willingness to go very, very deep into your desire, you discover a boatload about yourself. You're going to discover things that you didn't know and you're going to discover these hidden depths of yourself that are really the place, one, from which you can actually really give and serve and live your purpose and two, from which you actually get in touch with the very power source, as in the juice, to actually do the mission and do the rest of your life. So it actually takes courage to go that deep and to uncover these hidden depths. Now, you might want to ask me a question. So the third level is called desire setting, and we can cover that in a little bit of uh, in a second, if you like, but the third level of the desire formula is desire setting, which is desire setting is to the feminine, what goal setting is to the masculine. And it's a completely different process, <coughs> excuse me, than how we have largely been taught to goal set as women. And most of the time, it's my observation that when women goal set, they set themselves up for disappointment and they set themselves up to burn themselves out and to end up exhausted. Wow, I love that. I love the difference um, between goal setting and desire setting. I never thought to look at those two. Um, now you mentioned, um, well, let's go a little deeper into that. Like what sure. is desire setting versus goal setting? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an important one. It's one that I really discovered because of coaching so many women around the world. They'd be sort of, you know, we do, we doing sort of previously, I used to do normal sort of goal setting things. And then they'd be talking to me about the goal. Okay. There'd be the goal. And then we'd, we'd look at their life now. Right. And what I observed is there's this giant gap between where they are now and what they wanted. Now, the gap, uh, we sort of think, okay, well, that's normal. Okay, people are here and they want to get here. But the problem with the gap is the way in which they were being taught to go from A to Z. And the way they were being taught to go from A to Z in the masculine-oriented uh, goal-setting methodologies was setting themselves up to continue on the gerbil wheel of exhaustion, overwhelm, working too hard, wearing too many hats, juggling too many balls, and just doing all that and working, 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 working. And then if, if they got the goal, then by the time they got it, they're totally exhausted and spent and burnt out. Or what it really set them up to do was continually this, this sort of methodology of struggling and uh, striving and overwork that actually kept moving the goalposts, right? So the goal just kept moving out because the reason why I discovered the concept of desire setting is they hadn't set up inside themselves. They hadn't embodied the, uh, the, the goal. They hadn't landed inside themselves what it was going to feel like to achieve the goal. And I'm going to repeat that because... This is an important distinction for women with regard to goals because women set goals differently than men do or for, I should say for different reasons than men do largely. Of course, I'm doing big um, statements here. But largely women set up goals because of the way they want to feel when they achieve the goal. Even if they set some sort of financial goal, it's because they go, ah, oh, okay, if I reach that you know, half million dollar mark in my business or whatever, I'm going to feel X, Y, Z, but then they're not conscious of the, what they want to feel. And this is part of the gap that needs to be filled. They need to know 
Why do you want that goal? What is it that you're going to feel like when you get that goal? So I do a lot of work with women on the what are you going to feel like? What, what's that going to afford you? What's going to happen for you when you achieve this goal? And then basically desire setting is this process of reverse engineering goal setting such that they are so embodied and so clear on how they want to feel and what that's going to allow them to give and to serve with when they reach the goal, that they're embodying it now at the beginning of the cycle in such a way that even though we still have to take steps to move forward in time, they are actually embodying the conditions as in it's in their body, they've incarnated, they are living the conditions already such that the goal ends up being inevitable and sometimes way sooner than they thought. I love that. That's yeah. really, really incredible. I love that perspective shift that you're sharing around um, goal setting and our desires. I think it's really powerful. And, you know, I definitely recognize in myself that oftentimes like what, what I feel is going, what feels good is going to be what I do. Um, like, I mean, I'm a health coach and I even tell my clients, like, if it feels good for you to stop the alarm and not go to yoga, you're going to do that versus get up and go to yoga. So I love that you, um, on a macro perspective are applying that to like all of our, all of our goals in general. Yeah. Um, so that's really cool. And then, um, you had mentioned, um, the desire spectrum earlier. Can you explain a little bit about that? I'm really curious to know, um, what the desire spectrum is. Yeah, well, I mean, the desire spectrum is understanding and broadening also what I think people think of as desire, right? So we could, we could define desire outside of it just being around sexual desire, although this is important for me and I will talk about it, as what you want, okay? So we could say the engine, if you like, of desire is really about what you want, so, you know, when Napoleon Hill quotes, um, desire is the, is the foundation of all achievement, he's saying that without it, there is no engine, there's no fuel, there's no power source from which to move you forward toward the achievement, right? And as a woman, um, our power is held through desire into our sexual energy. Now, the thing is about sexual energy, again, I, 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 I'm separating sexual energy from sex per se because we are desire creatures. We are sexual creatures, women. We are all about creativity, right? So we, are, we birth babies, for God's sake. I mean, we <laughs> literally have this whole system that is built on creating things, right? And it creates from this know-how that we have in our body in our womb, in our pussy. And so getting to the point where we go from I'm hungry and I want a sandwich through to the other end where you allow yourself to have the courage and the, the, the sort of investigating kind of spirit to go, well, what do I really desire? Now, the reason why I'm saying that is somewhere in the middle here between I, I just need a sandwich right now because I'm hungry and I want a really nice home and to be really successful Sometimes in this middle territory, territory is a lot of conditioning, as in socioeconomic conditioning, and other people's desires for you that are not really your own. I'm going to give you an example. So um, let's say that you go, okay, I really want to uh, finish my degree, and then I want to get a great job in a, in a terrific company, and I want to get promotions, and I want to get married. And then I want to have three babies. Now, I think the way I've said that, I've kind of outlined that that's kind of normal, often followed, conditioned kind of concept about how people would like to do their life. I know I was conditioned in that way. I was conditioned to get a great education. I was conditioned to get um, a great degree and then a great job. And in fact, I did that for the first 13 years of my career, right? I literally followed what was very unconscious, right? As in it was conditioned on me that that's what I wanted. And then what happened in my sort of mid-20s is I started going, I was about to become one of the youngest directors of a commercial design company in Australia. And I went, 
I, I don't want this. I could see the path ahead of me. It had been trodden before, even if I was young, it doesn't, didn't matter. And I went, I started to question what I, I thought I wanted, right? And so it's so important as part of the desire spectrum process to get to some of the territory of what you think you want and have the courage to question it. Now, if, it, if you do that and you end up with the result, I still really want that great job, I want to be really successful and I want the husband and the family and the kids, then more power to you, sister. That's fantastic. But can you see that if you go through the process of questioning it, of assessing what's really yours and what may be conditioned on you, and then coming out the other end going, no, this is my choice, this is my desire, this is what I want, you're going to be way more awake. You're going to be way more engaged in it, way more present rather than just being unconscious and unawake in that process. And so as we kind of hit this middle territory and we go through a bit of a process of questioning and assessment, that needs to happen first. And then you can start to go, okay, well, what happens when I start to go really deep dive digging mining for what other deep desires might be and this is where you know as women diving into your sexual desire diving into the things that you want sexually is a really really juicy and powerful process um i mean i've seen people that i work with go from uh they don't even want sex to they're trying all sorts of juicy fun things sexually and what's happening for them is this really juicy awakening and it's not about doing that forever and it's not about you know, because the thing about desire, if you really understand desire, it's endless. Uh, this is what I mean about broadening the spectrum. Desire is endless and you could spend lifetimes exhausting your desire. The reason why I do it in my trainings is because the amount of self-knowledge that comes through this process and how it's so important to our understanding of ourselves and our will to get things that we want. Can you see the difference? Like, from thinking you want something to actually speaking it, understanding it clearly and getting it, receiving it is such an important thing for the human experience, right? So speaking your desires, receiving them, which is another one of the arts, by the way, the art of receptivity, it does something to our soul. It nourishes up us. And as women, when we start to deep dive, dig, and I'm pointing down because it goes down into the lower centers of the body. We go down into the pussy and we go down into these very deep, dark, unconscious chambers inside of ourselves. And as women, it's a little bit like mining for diamonds, right? Because sometimes we'd have to dig through a bunch of dirt, but then we find <laughs> these diamonds, right? These diamonds sort of come up and we go, oh, that's so juicy. And people don't, my experience is people don't really know themselves until they actually know that end of the spectrum of their desire, the amount of self-knowledge, self-understanding that they get through that process can completely change all these other desires and completely change their, their timeline, their moving forward and their life ahead. I love that. I love that. This is really powerful stuff that you're sharing with us. I'm, I'm loving it so much. And I love that you share that piece around um, um, sexuality and how these women are experiencing this new level of um, I guess, awakening or inspiration or clarity or, you know, self-understanding and self-love through opening up to those experiences. So I wanted to ask what, like, do you have any tips or advice on how we can um, sort of uh, work through, kind of release that shame around our sexuality and our desire so that we can just uh, receive and experience it? Yeah, it's such a good question, Kuros, because the thing is, as women, we've got our own story in this life, right? Now, whether you believe in past lives or not doesn't matter so much at the moment, but we've got our own stories. And just in this life alone, as women, um, you know, if you're in it from 20 to 70 at the moment, women are carrying this, uh, a lot of shame around their power, right? They're, they're actually carrying shame about being a woman, period, right? And that actually comes from centuries and centuries of burying and shaming the feminine and feminine power. And because sexuality and desire is such a fundamental part of feminine power, then 
you know, ergo, then they end up uh, feeling ashamed about their sexuality. And then there's, there's all these sort of myths out there in modern society, or there have been for a long time, that women women aren't as sexual as men or they don't like sex as much as men. It's just such a massive myth. So the, the sexual arena is the feminine. Um, there's a there's a Sanskrit story that speaks about uh, if sex were divided into ten parts and ten equal parts, that nine parts are for the woman and one part yeah. is for the man, right? Because wow. in because in in the Vedas they understood that sexuality is literally the feminine, literally the feminine. So for me, when a woman is out of touch with her sexuality, she goes, oh, I'm too old for that now, or I'm over that, or I don't like sex. It's like, whoa, sister, this is a huge indication that you're out of touch with your feminine power. And uh, it's very, you know, if someone's really got a stance on that, it's very hard to, to budge them. But if, if, you know, I can show them and they're willing, it's like you've got this world inside you of power, of pleasure, of... And again, it can sound selfish, selfish or self-centered, but when we own that, the reason why I train women like this is when, when we learn how to uh, dive in and plug in and fill up, we end up so filled up that we're full to overflowing, right? And that's the place from which to serve and to give from. And yet so many women who are in the shame or the... The, um, the selfless category. They think they're being selfless by putting everything in front of themselves. They are getting slowly, slowly more and more spent, exhausted and burnt out and drained. And I can tell you, I've got hor horrifying statistics about women's health since the 1960s um, that for me are a massive indicator that you've got women sort of from the 60s that went from being... Um, uh, largely sort of domestic, right? And then we start to enter the workforce. And then from the 1960s, I'll just give you one of the statistics. So since the 1960s to today, there's been a 60% increase in female-specific cancers. Wow. Cancers of the breasts, cancers of the ovaries, cancers of the cervix. We are hurting ourselves by being in our masculine all the time. So what we ta were taught is, okay, we were domesticated prior to the 50s and then we went, but I need to rise up in my power. I want to feel powerful. And then the only paradigms we had in the world at the time to be powerful were, oh, well, let's go and work. Let's become corporate. Let's prove to the world that we are as smart and as capable as men. And we did that, right? Women completely did that. But the unfortunate side effects of the sexual revolution is that women became powerfully masculine, not powerfully feminine. I love that. I love that. I'm reminded of, I can't remember where this is from, but this, this quote about how um, it, 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 yes, it is feminine. It is empowering to be success, a successful woman in a patriarchal society, but that doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, what, that's that might not be the direction we want to go we might actually want to shift it so that it's you know right that they're on equal balancing and you know just necessarily being super successful in this masculine patriarchal culture doesn't necessarily make you a champion for feminism even though that is still a great aspect of feminism i'm not knocking anyone who, who is that exactly i'm the same it's but, just the evolution. There's an evolution yeah. from the feminist movement of the 60s and the sexual revolution. Because, you know, like uh, the Dalai Lama quoted himself, you know, he quoted that the world will be saved by the Western woman, right? Mm -hmm. That was a famous quote by him. And what I understand him to mean by that is that the world is desperate and hungry for feminine values and it will be women that lead that, right? And so the, the revolution of our modern time is, well, what does it mean to be successful and powerful from our feminine, mm. not from our masculine. Mm. What does that mean? What does that feel like in our bodies? And how does that look different to the pre-existing masculine paradigms that we so far have experienced power and success through? I love that. I love that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I encourage, I definitely encourage, um, you know, our sisters watching that, might be more um 
more used to being in their masculine to survive in this world, what it would be like to, you know, be in our feminine. So um, I love, I love that this is coming up in this conversation so that, you know, this is something we can shift with, uh, with amazing sisters in the, in the audience watching. Um, and I wanted to go back to desire. Um, yeah. And um, I'd love to ask, how is it that we actually harness our desire to actually really get what we want? Yeah, and I and I did also want to address the question on shame again. I think um, let's just I'll ask you a question first. So the harnessing of the desire got a bit <laughs> of an image of putting a saddle on a horse there, which is not a bad image actually, or a bad bad, bad metaphor for desire, because it's a little bit like something that we have between our legs that's really powerful that we need to learn to actually ride it right um it's not that that bad a metaphor so <laughs> and, and yet you know the thing about that wild horse and that they the, the power of that part of ourselves first like if you were literally to break in a wild horse it would not let you put the saddle on it it, it wouldn't let you near it it wouldn't let you touch it so often what happens is when people first start to sort of go near their desire the true wild horse the force of it is kind of disinterested in them because it's good it's kind of going to them frankly but your life's kind of boring to me you know you're doing th what everybody else is doing and i'm not that interested in you <laughs> <laughs> so at first desire is a bit antagonistic you know the, the real power is a bit antagonistic to us and yet it's a development of a relationship that happens where if we go back to the we're breaking in the horse, you slowly start to you know, keep going out there, you keep engaging the horse, you feed it a little bit, you talk to it, you get to know it. And this is not a mental process, by the way. Real desire is something that is felt, it's feeling based, it's uh, gut feeling based, it's knowing, it's intuition, it's all of these core experiences of the feminine that will be the things that will arrive you at the destination of knowing your desire right it's not thinking i think i want is probably the conditioning i feel i want is something else i have this concept in my uh, powerfully feminine intensive trainings i'll get my women to do this exercise and i'll share it with you now so what i'll get my women to do is go okay so it's it's, it's lunchtime now and um you're going to ask head brain, I call it. You're going to ask head brain, what do you want to do right now? And head brain will go, I want to go for a drive and I need to go and do the grocery shopping, right? And then I go, okay, now let's ask pussy brain <laughs> what she wants to do. <laughs> and invariably people will go, oh, pussy brain wants something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> So I use this concept to illustrate the difference between thinking and the ordinary mind or the ordinary mental consciousness and the feeling and the getting into relationship to ourselves, our power, our desire at the lower level. There's actually statistics around at the moment. I don't have them on me at the moment around the second brain they're starting to talk about and they speak about it in the gut, which of course the scientists are probably men and they think it's a gut thing. Uh, but there's actually energetically so much wisdom in our lower centers. And they've studied this they, in Taoism for 8,000 years where they do the work on longevity and health and sexuality. And, of course, in uh, a lot of the Indian practices, there's practices where that include, you know, the Kama Sutra. You know, it's included as a spiritual practice because the circulations of energy that come when you start to tap into that force are so powerful and they can be turned toward the divine or they can be turned toward the partner or they can be turned toward a creative or a business endeavor. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, Pussy such, brain. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before. And it's definitely going to be fun to explore what she wants. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> um, and um, you said you had uh, you had another piece to share around shame. I, I, I wanted to I wanted to continue with that or, or address it a bit further. I think, Chris, one of the the important things as part of getting into feminine power is firstly to realize that you're not alone. 
a lot of the shame piece that I sort of started to speak about is held by all women at a very body level. I mean, just a couple of hundred years ago, we were being burnt as witches, right? So if we had any power as healers um, or, or vision, we had vision or we were, prof, uh, were, were oracles or whatever, we were, for, for years, we were literally destroyed for our power. So there's a, there's a, there's a word in Sanskrit called samskara. It's not samsara. It's a samskara. We've got this global wounding of the feminine. And so it's important that we share this. It's important that we come together. It's not like we're going to spend years moaning about losing our power. It's just it's important to recognise this is a globally held thing for women. And so together, in the line of the Dalai Lama's quote, together, we come together to encourage each other back toward our power, back toward the feminine. Um, it's not something that you're supposed to do alone. It's not something we need to do alone. And in line of the shame piece, if you have stories from this life that you need to share with someone or work with a therapist or coach about, then those things can be worked through. They can be addressed and they tend to be quite personal there. And the, when those charges or samskaras or wounds get moved out of you, it then sets you up to be able to be, be more comfortable and feel safer to actually dive back into your desire and own and love and dive into your own body and desire again. Yeah. This is really powerful work. It's like, it's, it's, it's bringing healing and transformation to like cultural wounding. It's like beyond the individual now. Yeah. So that's really, really powerful. Thank you for sharing this really powerful message and being a being a part of that change and being a part of that transformation and that's definitely one of the main intentions why I created this event so that we could do this kind of work so mm. I have so much gratitude to you for sharing um, your incredible wisdom and um, all of the ways we can access our desire and embody our womanhood in a um, greater capacity um, I know that you have a free gift for our sisters. Um, I'd love if you would share a little bit about that with us. Yes, sure. I'd love to um, offer you listening to this today. Uh, I've created a quiz uh, called the What's Your Desire Archetype Quiz. It's super fun, super revealing. It's just 12 little questions that you can jump online to take. At the end of which, it will, it will show you your very own desire archetype. And that is the first phase in self-discovery as to where you're at now. And then what you're going to be um, offered when you sign up and you put in your best email address, an email will be sent to you with a link to direct get another free gift, which is called the Feminine Archetypes Blueprint. Ooh. And in that 15-page document, you're going to actually have a look at all of the feminine archetypes. You're going to see where you are in that. And so you're going to be able to see how you can evolve toward the next archetype. Now, the feminine archetypes... Uh, in my trainings, I, I speak a lot about the difference between false feminine and true feminine and false masculine and true masculine, uh, partly because I think the understanding of feminine and masculine is completely misunderstood and that sometimes people relate to the lower or the immature or the false levels of both of them. And what we're trying to do is evolve into the true and the mature feminine and masculine archetypes. And so that's two free gifts for you. So try it out. It's really fun. Um, I look forward to, to serving you further moving forward in any way I can. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those amazing gifts. They sound so wonderful. I can't wait to explore them. Um, and how can all of us stay uh, better in touch with you? Yeah. Oh, a good way to do that would be to go to powerfullyfem.com. Uh, P O W E R F U L L Y FEM dot com. And the quiz is powerfullyfem.com forward slash quiz, right? So you can go to that to quiz. You can jump there on there. You can find out a bit more about what I do. You can contact me if you'd like to. Well, wonderful. It was a huge honor to have you with us here today. And um, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's been course. lovely to work with you. And I'm very honored to be here today and grateful. Thank you. I appreciate it. And you enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you, all of the sisters watching today's interview. 
Um, stay tuned for more and uh, have a beautiful rest of your day. Oh, 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 oh.